actually in gravitational field theories, um, a bit different from what she works on now. Um, she was then a research associate at Brandeis University, and it was when she started as a postdoc here at CFA um, that she really started working on computational stellar astrophysics, which is what she works on now. She became a research associate at the CFA in 2018, as well as a teaching fellow um, and an associate at the Institute for Applied Computational Science at Harvard, um, where she works on machine learning uh, applied to astrophysical research. So today she's going to be telling us about the magnetic nature of the CD period gap. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you for having me. It's always good to be back. I'm, I'm still here sometimes, but not always. Uh, and I, I'm going to talk today about work in collaboration with the usual suspects here, Jeremy Drake and Julian Alvarado Gomez and Sofia Mosco and Offer Cohen, who's now at Lowell University, at UMass Lowell, excuse me. <coughs> and I'm going to talk about the magnetic, magnetic nature of the cataclysmic variables period gap. So cataclysmic variables, which I'll call CVs from now on, as you can see that I have issues pronouncing them, um, are closed binary systems that consist of a white dwarf and a secondary mass donor star. And this secondary mass donor star is a, is a, is a cool star. And a cool star is a star that has an outer convective envelope. So I'm showing here the diagram of stellar interiors for masses for stars of different masses from more massive to less massive and stars have an, an and you can see in blue represents the radiative zone and the red represents the convective zones so stars low mass stars up to 1.3 solar masses or so have outer convective envelopes and those are the ones that we call cool star cool stars so the secondary, going back, so these stars, the, the cool stars, because of that convective envelope, develop magnet, magnetic fields on the surface. And those magnetic fields impulse magnetized winds. And that's how cool stars spin down. They lose angular momentum through these winds. And the mechanism, <coughs> that's called magnetic breaking. And the mechanism is that instead of the plasma escaping the star at the level of the surface of the star, so at one stellar radii, <coughs> radius, the, this plasma follows the magnetic field lines to a much larger distance, and that provides a lever arm that makes this a very efficient spin-down mechanism. That's typically a few uh, stellar radii. So that's called magnetic breaking. So going back to the CVs, that, I, as I told you, this star is a cool star, and therefore it has these magnetized winds, and is losing angular momentum through them. And because these systems are tightly locked, this is removing angular momentum from the whole system at a very efficient speed. Okay, so let me go back. Actually, magnetic braking controls the way these systems evolve. So magnetic braking is the dominant mechanism by which the, they lose angular momentum, at least for periods above three hours or so. When they're very close to each other in shorter periods, like less than two hours orbital periods, orbital or spin for, for this star is the same because they're tightly lock, locked, um, then gravitational radiation kicks in and dominates the whole thing. But for periods higher than three hours or so, so above the period gap, magnetic breaking is all that we need to take into account and gravitational radiation becomes negligible. So what is the period gap? And the period gap is, that, is a range of periods for which these systems are essentially not observed. And I'm showing here a histogram of observed number of systems as a function of orbital period in hours. And you can see that there's this region in which there's much less systems observed than, than in the rest. So, systems evolve from wherever they are born in this picture towards the left hand side and that's why because they're losing angular momentum and so for single stars when they lose angular momentum they spin down and that's intuitive but for for closed binaries when they lose angular momentum they do it at expense of their orbital uh, distance and so they get closer together and they spin up <coughs> so they're losing angular momentum and they're moving to a shorter periods so they're spinning up actually 
But while they do so, the secondary is losing mass through accretion to the white dwarf. And so they're getting closer together, and the secondary star is getting lower and lower mass until just about the upper boundary of the period gap, it becomes fully convective. That seems like an odd coincidence and led to believe that something happened because of this fully convective limit. In addition, in the 80s, Pruden readers showed that a fast enough and large enough decrease in angular momentum loss rate, this is angular momentum loss rate, this is artificial, right? This is a step function. Let's say you shut off or you shut off 90% of the angular momentum loss in an instant, that would lead to a temporary shutdown of accretion. If that happened near this limit, that would actually explain the gap. Because the way we observe these systems is through their accretion. So if they stop accreting because they stop losing angular momentum in this way, then we wouldn't see them. So that made sense until Nick Wright and Jeremy Drake followed up with, by another paper of the same authors plus some other authors showed that this is probably not the case. So let me explain what I'm showing here. It's X-ray luminosity over volumetric luminosity as a function of Rossby number. Rossby number is Rotation period over convective turnover time. So it's pretty much, you can think of a rotation period if you want to think of it more intuitively, but it's normalized to get rid of the spectral type dependency. This is a measure of the convective size of the, of the, size of the convective uh, envelope. So Rossby number is just a dimensionless quantity that is related to rotation period. These are the hollow circles are sun-like or partially convective stars. And that's a previous result that we already knew from also from the same authors in 2011 um, that first ignore the, the, the pink and red ones. Just the, fr from just the hollow, this is called the activity rotation relationship. And it was shown that stars behave like this, right? That when they are rotating faster, so towards the left, they emit more X in X-rays until they become saturated in this regime when they were no longer faster rotation means more emission. So we knew that from 2011, right? And also, I want to emphasize that X-rays, in cool star X-rays, is a proxy for magnetic activity. So this means that faster rotating stars have stronger magnetic fields. And eventually, we don't know if they don't have stronger magnetic fields anymore than, than they used to have, or just X-rays get saturated for another reason. Anyway, we knew this already, but we didn't know what happened at the fully convective limit. Actually, we thought the dynamo would change. However, if you look at the pink and the red circles, you can see that the X-ray properties of fully convective stars are identical to the partially convective ones. In particular, in the CV regime, we are over here, very fast rotating star, uh, fully convective stars. And so, because X-ray is a proxy for activity, the strong magnetic fields have to be there in the fully convective regime. So this explanation that when the star became fully convective, it didn't generate magnetic fields anymore, and then it didn't lose angular momentum anymore, and then that's why you get this drop in 90%. So this explanation of, okay, maybe at the fully convective limit, um, then the dynamo doesn't work anymore. We don't have strong magnetic fields anymore, and then we don't have the, the magnetized winds anymore, then the angular momentum loss drops suddenly, and then the accretion stops, and that's why we don't see them in the gap. It doesn't, doesn't explain this anymore, because they still have strong magnetic fields. And we know that for a fact from, from different, not only from the x-rays. So what happens at that limit? What, what causes this decrease 
if that's what explains the gap, it cannot be the dynamo because of the fully convective limit. So now I'm going to digress a little bit to talk about what we know about magnetic braking, and I promise I'll come back to that problem, just to see if we can find uh, another reason why this could be happening. So back to the, to the cool stars with the magnetic fields and the angular momentum loss. As I told you earlier, activity regulates rotation because that's how stars lose angular momentum. So activity really regulates the speed as which, at which they spin down or up in the case of CVs. But also, we just saw from the activity rotation um, relationship that rotation controls activity, it fuels activity through the dynamo action. Faster rotating stars have stronger magnetic fields. So this self-regulating mechanism results in a well-behaved function, uh, relationship between rotation periods and ages that depends on the spectral type. But this is a very powerful tool. This is the basis of gyrochronology that allows us to translate rotation periods into ages. Rotation periods we can measure to great precision. Ages are really difficult to, to determine. So, and that's due to this self-regulating mechanism that I just described. If we take 2D cats at constant ages of this, of this uh, plot, of this 3D plot, then we expect to see the following. We expect to see that rotation periods are a unique function of color for each age that evolves with age according to Skumanich law for spin down, like that. However, when we look at young stars, so if we, we look at young open clusters, rotation periods in the open clusters, we see the following. I'm showing here six open clusters from youngest to oldest. These are rotation periods in the y-axis, color in the x-axis, Low mass stars are to the right, and fast rotators are at the bottom. And we see that while the Skumanich branch seems to be there, there's also this branch of persistent fast rotators that gets less and less populated with age, and a gap in between that also gets less and less populated with age. <coughs> so this suggests that stars are born in this regime of fast rotating, and then they stay there for a while, and then they transition to the other branch in, a, in what should be a fast transition, and that's why the gap is empty. So we understand the red branch, but we don't understand the blue branch. And many models have tried to explain this with different levels of success, but most models assume that stars are all dipoles. But if we look at fast rotating stars, they don't look very dipolar at all. They look like they have a lot of complexity in their magnetic field. These are Zeeman Doppler imaging observations. That's the way we observe the distribution of magnetic fields on the stellar surface. And so the question now is, what does that do to the angular momentum loss? Can that be a key to understand this bimodal distribution of rotation periods and maybe the CV period gap? that I will go back to. And some of you might have heard me talk about this part because it's a, the spin down model, but I need it for the others, so I apologize. I have to go through it. So to understand what complexity does to angular momentum loss, we, we do 3D MHD simulations of the stellar winds. And here I'm showing the magnetic structure of a star, so the, pretty much the wind structure of a star, of a constant magnetic flux. So the magnetic, total magnetic flux of each of these is the same, but with different <coughs> orders. So this is a dipole, this is a quadrupole, this is an octopole, increasing complexity towards the right. And I didn't draw the open field lines, because as you can see, it makes it very confusing. But the, the, the amount of open field lines is proportional to the empty space you can see on those plots. At this level, there's almost no open field line. So we see from the simulations that the effect of this higher complexity is closing otherwise open field lines and therefore preventing the winds from escaping, removing angular momentum. And so if, you, if, 
if a star has higher complexity, you, ex you should expect it to spin down slower because it just cannot get rid of the angular momentum through the winds because all the field is closed like here. So we quantify these. We did many simulations. These are uh, 30 of them. This is angular momentum loss as a function of multiple order for three different magnetic field strengths. And this is a dipole, this is a quadruple. Again, complexity is increasing towards the right. And we can see that this is log scale. So we can see that this is a huge effect. Overall, it's three orders of magnitude from a dipole to a high order, like 10 or so, that decrease in angular momentum loss rate. <coughs> But just going from a dipole to a quadrupole, let's say you model everything with a dipole, but the star turned out to be a quadrupole, there's one order of magnitude difference as well. So this, this is an effect that we shouldn't be neglecting. Is this a theoretical calculation? Or? This comes from the same 3D MHD models. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, OK, yeah. For different multiple orders and the same flux, yes. We thought of this. Actually, we did the simulations, and I got the x-rays out of it. But we think that this is steady state. So this is not taking into account uh, flares or fl flaring activity. And we think in the regime where we can observe well with x-rays, the flares are going to be dominating. So it's really hard to, to test that with x-rays. Well, I think with a highly complex, but because these are steady state, I cannot tell you from this. I think because just because of reconnection. Okay, so this, in principle, at least qualitatively, explains this pretty well because if if we think of the CDI observations, the observations of the distribution of magnetic field on stellar surface. They tell us that faster rotating stars have higher complexity. And so faster rotating stars are younger stars. For single stars, they just spin down. So these should, they should be in this regime of high complexity where they lose very inefficiently angular momentum. And so they would be kind of stuck here, rotating fast without losing much angular momentum. And then while they do lose, because they don't lose much, but they do lose angular momentum, they would move towards the less complex regime and eventually reach this more dipolar kind of regime that would represent the red branch that no wonder why is the one we understand when we assume stars are dipoles. So we quantify this and now we take into account for the angular momentum loss, we use the dipolar one that we assume is the red one, the one we understood, times this modulation that we get from the simulations. And this modulation is proportional. It, it depends, it's not proportional, but it depends on the complexity of the magnetic field. So we build a simple spin-down model where, again, this is just the dipolar losses that, we, that come from Skumanich that we previously knew, and that depends on the complexity. And then we have to, the, the thing is, we don't know how the complexity of the field evolves with age or rotation period or Rossby number that they're all pretty much the same, indicating the same in, in stars. Uh, rotation period is, a, is, is an indicator of age, as I mentioned before. But we do know that for young stars, it decreases. So fast rotating stars that are towards the left have higher complexity. That's what CDI tells us. So we can just, because there's not so many CDI maps, we can just do this, we just know qualitatively that this is the case, a decreasing function. That's all we know. So we try the simplest function we can, and then we have reasons to believe that after main sequence, there's a new increase. Uh, and just to be consistent with Van Stater's observations, we, we give the, the function we propose, we give it this shape, but this part will not affect anything I'm going to show, so we don't know about that part. Okay, and these would represent the saturation re regime that I showed in the activity rotation uh, plot. So, wait, yeah, sorry. Okay, so that's what we propose. 
and that's this function, and we fit for these two numbers. The one is just saying that we're going to have loss less than one for the complexity because one is a dipole in our model. So we run synthetic populations, and we get very good agreement with observations of rotation periods in open clusters. I'm showing the same six clusters I showed before. In blue is our simulations. In red is the data. And we get both branches, and we get the gap, and we get the right time evolution of the three ingredients. I want to emphasize that this is just a function we proposed for, and we optimized two parameters. However, you should watch out and stay tuned for Eli, who's sitting here, a Southampton student, that is doing a data-driven optimization of this. We'll see what data really tells us, what this function is and what the parameters are to, to get a better fit. Okay. I am going to... I wanted to show you this movie because it's how the model predictions on the rotation evolution compared to the observations when we have them. But okay, I didn't have as much time as I thought <laughs> Okay, so I promised I would go back to CVs. And just to remind you, this is a cool star, and we just talked, and losing angular momentum with magnetic braking, and we just discussed how there's an ingredient that we were ignoring in magnetic braking, and it turns out to be really important and not just a second order effect or anything. So the question is now how does that play in, in CVs? orbital evolution, does this matter? That, does the complexity of that star, the, of the magnetic field on that star, matters? So we do the following. Because the secondary star is fully convective in the regime we're interested in, then we look at single stars CDI maps of late M dwarfs, so the same spectral type. We try to see what the complexity of the magnetic field looks like in those. And we run spherical harmonic decompositions on each of, of, of the available maps for late M dwarfs. And we calculate the dominant order. The way we do that is which is calculated, uh, we calculate a weighted average, and the weighting factor is the flux in each order, like how much flux in the dipole times the dipole plus how much flux in the quadrupole. So we get a dominant order. And we plot that against period, which is rotation period or orbital period in the CD case. They're both the same. And we see that there's a trend. This is period in hours. And we see that as we go to shorter periods, so faster rotating uh, stars seem to have more complexity, just like we saw for sunlight stars. Same thing. Faster rotating seems to have more complexity. And in, the, in, our, in our picture, that means more complexity means going towards this regime where they do not lose much angular momentum, where they lose angular momentum at a more uh, inefficient rate. So we don't have data to go all the way to the three hours period uh, that we're interested in. This is about 10 hours, so we don't have data to go all the way. But if we assume that this is the trend, and we use our spin-down model, and for the complexity, we use this trend. So that's what we're assuming, that the single star's complexity represents well the secondary star in the CVs, because they're the same rotation period and the same spectral type, and that this trend continues. If we do that, we find the following. We find that for a single, stop, a single system with time, the angular momentum loss decreases just at 3.2, just where we expected it, decreases 90% pretty suddenly. The question is, if you remember what I showed with Sprit and Reader, it was a step function. So the, quest, the big question is, is this fast enough? I mean, we expected it would decrease when we saw the trend of the M drawers. But is this fast enough? Because the time scale matters. Because it's a, yeah. So at a given complexity in the multiple structure, uh, when the star starts uh, slowing down, then the light cylinder starts to expand. So then the close uh, uh, field lines, uh, uh, would, would this more extended distribution of closed field lines start to work against uh, the loss of angular momentum and, and, and also break the star? I'm not sure I understood. <laughs> so, uh, one way that uh, angular momentum starts getting lost is when field lines open, and then yeah. uh, you're, you're, sorry, when angular speed gets, gets lost, the field line open, and you try to get some angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Another way I, I'm thinking of is that uh, just by virtue of the light cylinder growing in radius when the star uh, slows down, 
then the distribution of even closed field lines becomes more extended. And then that more extended distribution of field lines uh, with uh, whatever particles are gyrating on them uh, starts to, uh, would that start to slow down the angular speed of the star? But that, yeah, well, I don't think that would be a big effect. And that's not angular momentum okay. loss, right? But you but could still, yeah, loss, yeah, you could still see that. But that, I don't know if that would be something on the same time scale. Like it's not stars are spin spinning down. And this could be something like more of a magnetic cycle, I imagine, or something that just a trend with stellar age. Yeah, so that would just get in the way of it losing uh, angular speed uh, as long as when it starts slowing down and if the lens just get bigger, but not to Yeah, not like to this. this. Yeah, is it so like a different... It's, it's, it's a dominant effect. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that later, but I think it's a different time scale and a different uh, effect that yeah, could happen, definitely. Okay, so... Yeah, so if, if this, so this seems to be a result of that increase of complexity that we observe in late M dwarfs when we're reaching the three hour period. And that it turns out that it, does, it, is, it, this is, it is fast enough to result in a complete shutdown of the accretion. So that was not obvious because the, the play here is the time scale for thermal equilibrium of the star because the star accretes because it's inflated, because it's out of thermic equilibrium, and if it has or not time to adjust when this decrease happens. And it does happen fast enough that, that it does result in a, in a shutdown of the accretion. Yes? What, what's the ex uh, this is there, what's the exponent? 10 to the... 10 to the 8. 8. Mm -hmm. It's time, sorry, yeah, and it's 10, 10 to the 8. So this is for a single star. And then, if we, then we run synthetic populations, and we find, indeed, that you should expect a gap in these periods. Again, this is assuming the complexity of the secondary star behaves the same way as late M dwarfs of the so same spectral type in single stars at the same rotation rate. Oh, okay, I'm going to stop there, then I'm going to skip this. This beautiful movie by Julian. Anyway, so magnetic, so to summarize, magnetic complexity is missing in spin-down models, so you need to take it into account, it's, it's, it's crucial. And it seems like a complexity increase in the CV systems in the secondary star is happening and leading to this magnetic breaking interruption that leads to the mass accretion interruption and then uh, the CV period gap is a natural outcome of this. Okay, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Thank you. I think the three hours. I think the, for the gravitational radiation, you have to be less than two hours or so. It also depends on the balance of mass. I think less than two hours. I don't know, three hours. Gravitational radiation here is really negligible, I think. I mean, these are not two black holes. These are, um, yeah, I don't think. I mean, the, it drops quickly after, with, with, Orbit, L distance, so I don't think so, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Any final question? So, did I get it right that your magnetic models predict that for a single star, the magnetic, magnetic complexity will decrease towards a dipole situation? For a single star, yeah. Okay, so the, the opposite is happening because of the binary. Yes. Okay, so I got it right. Thanks. <laughs> All right, let's thank Cecilia again.
strong magnetic fields um, and their influence on the stellar activity and the winds of type stars through both observations and simulations. Um, and he's only here till the end of November. He'll be moving to Compton. Um, and uh, today he's going to be telling us about simulating coronal mass ejections in active stars. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot for having me here. Um, this is a work uh, that I've been doing in the last couple of years with all my collaborators here at the CFA, this group of, uh, let's say, the ones that are interested in stars in the High Energy Astrophysics Division, uh, including as well Ra Rakesh, who is now in Harvard, who used to be also a postdoc here, and Federico Fraschetti, who comes here as a visitor from time to time, but he's based in, in Arizona. This is a work uh, involving coronal mass ejection, but it will have a heavily component on simulations. Um, so first, just to make sure where everyone is on the same page, I just want to make sure that we get the distinction between flares and coronal mass ejection. When I say a flare in a star, I'm referring to the energy release that is typically associated with reconnection. Uh, so I'm talking about the light is emitted uh, across the electromagnetic spectrum. When I'm talking about coronal mass ejections, I'm talking about the magnetized plasma that is released into the solar wind or the stellar wind. Uh, so I'm showing you two, two examples here. Whoops, I don't know what is this. Um, um, uh, in the sun, so a flare in the top panel and a CME in the lower panel. And if we look at the sun, uh, the statistics tell us that large flares, the big ones, the bigger options, typically come with a CME. So the association rate is more than 90% or so. So when you see a big flare, you typically see a CME. And this immediately poses the question for people interested in stars, especially the high energy aspects of them. What happened in reactive stars? Because active stars have larger flares than the sun, and those flares are much more frequent. Um, so Jeremy one was one of, one, one of the first ones uh, asking this question, and he took what we know for coronal mass ejections in the sun, which is what's plotted here in gray. This is mass, this is kinetic energy as a function of the X-ray flare of serving the sun. And basically what these plots tell tells you is basically what I already said. Bigger flares ha are more massive, and are more energetic. There are a few things that I want you to remember. First, um, a coronal mass ejection is much more energetic than a flare. So when you look at, at the flare and, and the X-rays, uh, a coronal mass ejection is typically 200 times more energetic. Uh, the X-rays are only 1% of the total flare energy. So when you combine all the volumetric flare energy, you reach uh, a, a number that is comparable to the CMEs, and still CMEs are still more energetic. So CMEs are more energetic than flares. When you do this calculation and you extend this relation to the flare activity of active stars, you reach these numbers. And these numbers may not tell you anything right now, but I will tell you that if you do the analysis, these numbers make no sense for what we know about mass loss in stars and the kinetic energy and the conservation of energy. So the problem, the conclusion in this paper is that these relations, you cannot extend these relations to the level that we observe in active stars because basically physics fails. Um, so what are those considerations? The first part of it is the mass loss in stars. So the different studies also find similar numbers for t Tauri stars, this is Alicia Arnio's paper, but these numbers are inconsistent with a, a very strong requirement that these winds need to be transparent in radio because otherwise we won't be able to see the stars in radio and we do see them. Um, and observational evidence supports that active stars, very active stars, are actually have very low mass loss rates. So this is a plot from Ryan Wood and collaborators. This is plotting mass loss as a function of X-ray uh, activity. This is a proxy for magnetic activity. Our sun is here with one and a given X-ray flux. And you can see known guys as Proxima Centauri, EV lag. These are very active M dwarfs. And you see that mass loss up to, you can reach up to 100 times the solar value, but you don't reach the numbers that are plotted here, which are actually about four, maybe five orders of magnitude, the solar one. So this is, um, this is why, and this is only taking into account the stellar wind alone. We are not talking about any CMEs here. Um, and the energy frequency consideration, the things get worse. Um, so the largest solar flare is on the order of 10 to 31 ergs, but you, when you go to an M dwarf, so T tauri stars, you reach three orders, four orders of magnitude more. Um, the largest flares are on the order of 10 to the 37, and active stars, in the particular case of MDORS, they show that the, the difference between active and inactive is m related to the amount of energy they deposit in flares, but not to their frequency. They are, fre frequent, they are flaring as frequently, the same frequency between them. Um, 
And this is important because those active stars, as, as Cecilia was saying, in this saturated regime that she was talking about, where E.V. Lackis, this guy here, basically their corona is all the time flaring. So the entire corona is only flares. And if you remember what I told you, that flares, if you go to the saturated regime and flares only have 1% of this energy in X-rays, that means that the remaining amount of energy goes to the CMEs. That means that the CMEs are carrying away 10% of the volumetric luminosity of the star. This means that you will shut down your stars very quickly. Because this light curve, this is like a day of observations. So if you are generating all these flares, you run out of energy in no time. So this is a big problem for stellar astrophysics. And um, so I, I wanted to start here because just this is like a personal note. Note that in my abstract, I mentioned exoplanets, which are very uh, famous this week. But you don't need exoplanets to make stars interesting. They're interesting on their own. Uh, so a possible solution for this is a suppression of coronal mass ejections by a large-scale magnetic field. And this idea comes from solar observations. Sometimes you get active regions like this one, which has a very strong dipolar field here. And this particular active region generated all these flares. This looks like the light curve of, an, of, of a very active star. But this is the sun. This is a GOES light curve. And you see all these things here. These are M-class flares, but are very big ones, and six X-class flares, which are the largest in our category. All these flares, and you only got one coronal mass ejection. Remember what I told you, big flares in the sun typically make CMEs. But in this case, you only have one CME for more than 40 flares or so. The answer for this is supposed to be that this strong magnetic field is containing the plasma. Not, the plasma is not able to go, but the light can go out. So we believe that in stellar observation, as Cecilia was also telling us in the previous talk, we have enough magnetic fields to do this. So this is a plot showing the stellar mass against rotation period. The sun is here, slowly rotating stars here, faster rotating stars here. This is solar mass stars, M doors around here. And the only important thing about this plot is that the size of the symbol represents the strength of the large scale magnetic field. These are measurements, this is observations. And you see these very big symbols here in the M doors regime. These stars have large scale kilogauss magnetic fields compared to the solar one, which is on the order, on the, which is on the order of few gauss. If you don't believe in observations, then very well, you can ask uh, your favorite theoretician. And in dynamo simulation, you also predict that these particular stars should have kilogauss fields in their surface. So we have magnetic fields to do this suppression of CMEs. So that's the thing that we did in this particular paper in 2018, when we started exploring the suppression of coronal mass ejection in active stars. Um, so for this, we did a series of 3D coronal mass ejection simulations using some of the latest models that we employed to simulate coronal mass ejections in the sun. Um, this is using the Alphen wave solar model. And this particular uh, um, study is the one that validated this coronal mass ejection model to solar observations. So this is from the press release from NASA. This is how the model predicts the CME going away. And this is compared to a particular observation of a CME. So this is very important for us because we want to use models that have some sort of grounding to the best known star, which is the sun. So we took this model and then we apply it to a younger sun. So we did a very nice spa for the sun. We wait to make it younger, at least 4 billion years. And this particular young sun has a much stronger dipolar field as, uh, as we observe in observations. These young stars have stronger magnetic fields in the large scale component. And we ran a set of numerical models. This is not so important. Uh, we did this in a medium sized cluster in Germany. And the results came out that you can have, uh, for a particularly strong, that will be very strong in the solar case with an associated flare of X 5.0, those CMEs in this particular scenario will be completely confined. They will not be able to leave the corona. Um, so the material is forced to follow the field lines and is not escaping. Um, this is showing Doppler shift signals, basically, just the difference uh, in the radial velocity of the material. If you place the same coronal mass ejection in the sun, it will look something like this. This will be a very big eruption traveling above 2,000 kilometers per second. But this is in a very weak large scale magnetic field, which the, the sun has. So we actually could go even further and put numbers for things that we don't observe in the sun typically. Flares on the order of X 100, or almost 1,000 in the GOES classification. We don't even have classifications for those. And those flares will have very large kinetic energies and masses. Uh, but in those cases, the, 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 the coronal mass ejections are able to break out and go away and carry away mass uh, and energy. When you put all these results in context, you will see that we can compare this, the coronal mass ejection speed of our simulation against 
what we expected from observations, which are these lines here, two different studies, one in terms of the X-ray flux of the flare, one in terms of the poloidal flux erupting, and we see that all our simulation are actually slower than what is expected for solar and extrapolation of solar relationships. The masses behave much similarly between them. These are, again, two observational studies that predict how the mass should behave in the very high uh, flaring uh, energies. And we believe that all these numbers should go down because we, I think we, est we overestimated a little bit the masses. But all these numbers probably are the maximum values that these quantities can have. So the important part here is that the large scale magnetic field confines uh, the flares and co confines the CME and makes them go out slowly, much more slowly. This has strong consequences for the amount of kinetic energy that they can carry, which is what's plotted here. Different axes, this is the amount of flux of the simulation, and this is the X-ray energy of the flare, and this is a conversion to the total flare energy and the volumetric energy. And this would be the parameter space for solar CMEs, pretty much all the CMEs that we have observed in the sun lay down in this area, and this particular 75 Gauss would be able to trap all of them. So if we suddenly increase the magnetic field of the sun, the large scale by a factor of 70 or so, we wouldn't be able to see any CME or pretty much none of them. You, you could see here that there are two uh, historical events, the Carrington event and another event much, uh, much further uh, away in the past that are much more energetic and probably they, they would have been able to go away. So the bottom line here is that escaping CMEs are much less energetic than what you would expect. And remarkably, the historical candidates and the direct detection, a very recent one, actually show this, and I will show this in the next slide. Um, um, so the magnetic suppression will mitigate the small scale events, the small, and only the very big ones that we call the monster CMEs, and I recommend this paper from Sophia, uh, will be able to escape. So until very recently, this is, this is really a question because if you work in high energy and stars, you would realize that these stars are flaring the whole time. You see thousands of flares, and in, uh, it would be natural to already have observed a lot of CMEs, but this is not the case. Until very recently, they, we had no detections of coronal mass ejections in stars, and we have been looking for them. Um, so actually, Sophia did this year a comprehensive compilation of all the candidates, um, and this is, these are two plots from her paper which you're seeing again the mass of the CME against the same kind of measurement of X-ray energy of the flare, and this is the kinetic energy. These again is the cluster of solar data points, some historical solar events, uh, which are very interesting to read how they derive these properties, and all the other points are basically the best candidates for stars. So you can see the masses kind of behave, kind of a way of extrapolating the solar relation, which is this red line, um, but the kinetic energy is actually are actually below, much below, several orders of magnitude below for what you would expect. This is precisely what we are saying. The escaping coronal mass ejections are much more, are much less energetic. And this point that I'm plotting here uh, is precisely the very recent detection by Constanza Argiroffi using Chandra, and when they were able to see the very telltale of a Doppler shift signature after a flare in a subgiant star, if I'm not wrong. So this is a direct detection. All the other points are very good candidates. So again, this point is again consistent to what we're saying. Um, all right, so that was the first part of the study, but this was applied to a solar type star, and now we're moving into the M dwarf regime. Uh, this is from a very recent paper that I'm actually coming to you from the future, um, and regarding what the corona does when we contain one of these coronal mass ejections, but in the case of an M dwarf. And why M dwarfs? Well, I don't think I need to say much about, about them. This is what we are interested here in the CFA and in our group in the CFA to study. But m are of particular importance because of, of course, exoplanets. Um, you have here uh, stellar mass against this distance, and you have here the solar system. And this blue shaded region is what is called a classical habitable zone. Basically, it's a region of space in which the distance is just right for the planet to have liquid water on the surface, provided sufficient atmospheric pressure. You can interpret this plot, basically, if you will be able to take the Earth and place it around different stars, would the Earth be able to sustain this liquid water at the surface? Uh, you see here famous examples like Proxima Centauri and the Trappist guys here. Um, only these three guys are in the habitable zone. As you can see, to be inside the habitable zone, you need to be very close to your star, and this puts you dangerously close to all this magnetic activity that we have been telling you about. So, this is important as well because the majority of stars in the Milky Way galaxy are m dwarfs and in the universe. So we should study them, and in particularly the effects of their enhanced magnet magnetism. 
Uh, so we are actually now moving to this strong field and high complexity regime. And for this, we partner up with people doing dynamo models, very sophisticated one like Rakesh. He did a numerical simulation of a dynamo model for a fully convective M-dwarf, which is shown here. And we adapted to make it run in our numerical models of coronal mass ejection. So now we are running an eruption of a coronal mass ejection in an M-dwarf for the first time. Um, and the idea is to study what the corona does when you put these eruptions in background magnetic fields that are compatible to what we know for M-doors. These are not the most active M-doors. The values that we're using here are limited by our numerical capabilities right now. These would be considered low to moderately active M-doors, like reaching up to the level of Proxima Centauri, which is a moderately active star. Um, so the idea here was to explore how this magnetic confinement spectrum looks like. So when we can have a very strong uh, eruption, this will be comparable to the Carrington event in the sun, except for the mass, which is lower. Um, and then we can have weak confinement when the magnetic field of the star is weak, which is only here in this case for a particular case of 600 Gauss. And then in, in there, you can have just uh, a coronal mass ejection basically blowing away from the star, carrying uh, a lot of mass and energy. You can increase the magnetic field of the star, and then you start confining a little bit this eruption, uh, and then the eruption is not able to go away as easy, but eventually it manages to break through, uh, and you can have the very strongly confined field when you increase the magnetic field even further, and then this particular eruption is below the suppression threshold and is not able to escape. So the, our idea is to explore what the corona is doing when all these things are happening, and can we find ways to observe this in the future. Uh, and this is what we did in this paper. So this is basically the first case, the weak CME confinement. This will go very fast, but I will just put it in a, in a relevant moment. The CME blows away, and you can see the corona response. You cannot see this here. Oh, OK. These are three different synthetic images of three different coronal band passes that are showing you high temperatures. This is high, medium, and low temperatures in the corona. I don't know if this looks any better. Probably not. This is supposed to be green. And this is on the order of 6.2 in logarithm of temperature. Uh, and you can see here three different snapshots of when the, this CME that I just showed you was blown away. Here is a plot uh, showing you the relative flux in each one of these band passes. And the purple one, which is the contours here, is X-rays. It's X-rays in a particular band in the soft X-ray band. What we basically see is when this CME is blown away due to the compression of the magnetic field, it will compress the entire coronal material, increasing their density and temperature, and it will give rise to this particular signature that looks like a flare, but it's not a flare. It looks like a flare, but it's not powered by magnetic recognition. This is what I'm trying to say. So it's a brightening of the star in the, in the high temperature levels, and then it is, it's going to start in very high temperatures and move slowly to lower temperatures, and you will have a very particular signature in the Doppler shift. So first, the eruption will collapse towards the star because the strong magnetic field confinement, and then we'll be able to go away. And this is just a, three snapshots of how the Doppler shift of this will look like. We believe that these particular Doppler shifts and this particular time scale would be accessible for something like links. It would be able to integrate in this particular time scale and be able to resolve this for nearby m doors at least. Uh, and there are hints that this particular process is might, may be also happening in the sun in this so-called micro CME eruptions. Uh, this is a nature paper here when they explore this. Um, when you have partial CME confinement, I'm changing, changing here the view. So now we will have a side view of the event. And again, now the CME is blowing into that direction. And then here you have the same. This is like the light curve of this. Again, my hand ties in x-rays, which is what we care in this seminar. And what you see here is that this particular flare-like profile becomes longer but weaker. Mm -hmm. And this is because, actually, the CME is being slowed down. So a lot of energy is being lost. But also the background here is, is higher because this is, again, a stronger magnetic field for the star. What is interesting here as well is that the CME, before it's able to go away, gets fragmented and generates, gives rise to this structure that they look very much like uh, prominences in the sun uh, that show particular patterns of Doppler shifts that are comparable to what we see in the sun. So this is what, just, just an animation showing you kind of how this looks in the star. Basically, this color code is showing Doppler shifts in the corona. Things are going, going up and other things are falling down. So we believe that this could be related to some sort of a, analogous to the coronal rain cycle that we see in the sun. And for the final case, the strong coronal mass ejection confinement, this is the CME that is actually not a CME, it's a failed CME. 
Um, this CME is not able to go anywhere, uh, but it, it does give some, um, generate some impact in the corona that may be detectable. Uh, this is again how all these diagnostics look like. This is the light curve, and you can see our response of the corona is much more slow. Uh, it, it doesn't look like a flare at all. It's just like a little bit like a brightening, and all this material stays confined in the corona and eventually falls back into the star. And this kind of behavior, this kind of net redshift of things falling back into the star has been observed in several active stars like A. Cat Draconis. Um, all right. So that was um, precisely what we did in this particular paper. And I'm, I'm going to use the remaining minutes that I have to present you what we are working right now. And it's shifting to a different frequency. And now we're trying, this is a draft, uh, paper in draft, trying to understand what happens with the radio emission of these coronal mass ejections. Um, so this is because there's a, a connection between the coronal mass ejections blowing away and a particular type of radio signature, this, which is called type 2 radio bursts in the sun. They are indicative of an MHD shock. This is the CME shocking the stellar material in the inner heliosphere. And there's a strong connection with uh, energetic particle events, which are also very important, but I'm not going to talk about them here. This is how they look. This is frequency in a radio spectrum against time, and they are characterized by these two drifts, which are typically associated with a fundamental and the first harmonic of the plasma frequency in that location. Um, so this is, for instance, how they look in the sun. This is a, an alpha and speed map in, in the projection of the plane of the sky. This is how they look in a, above an active region, coronal hole, and a quiet sun. And you can see how the numbers of the alpha and speed are here. This is from this particular study of Suka and collaborators. And what we believe is we observe a type 2 radio burst exactly when you are able, when your CME is actually shocking the MHD material, the material in the corona. And this is how it looks like. This is the alpha speed, and this is the coronal mass ejection speed. One important key element here is that the shocks in the sun typically occur, occur very close to the surface. So this is histograms from this particular paper from Natko Panswami and collaborators in 2005. This is the number of events emitting at different radio frequencies, and the shock location is located, uh, sorry about the redundance, but it's very close to the surface. This is 1.8 solar radii up to 2.1. So this occurs very close to the corona, in a very dense region of the corona. And the, thing, the reason why this is important is because this emission is directly related with the ambient density. So if, if these shocks occur in a region of different density, that means that the, sh the frequency of the emission will be completely shifted to different values. And this is what we believe is actually happening in our simulations. This is a much stronger coronal mass ejection that we simulate around an MDORF as well. Now you can see how it's traveling very fast and eventually it would reach the orbit of Proxima b, exoplanets again, but I'm not going to talk about them here. So this is how the alpha speed looks like for our, one of our solar simulations, and this is for an M dwarf. As you can see the color code, yellow indicates very large alpha speeds. Remember, to generate type 2 radio bursts, your CME needs to be faster than the local alpha speed. So it's going to be very difficult for your CME to generate any type 2 radio bursts here because the alpha speed is super large because strong magnetic fields, high, uh, low densities in some regions. Uh, however, the directionality matters. There are regions in which you can actually form type 2 radio bursts. And this is what we are showing you here. This is basically a similar plot as the one that I showed you before, showing you how is the alpha speed profile compared to the coronal mass ejection speed profile. And you can see that actually at some point this coronal mass ejection ge would generate a CM an, an MHD shock. The important thing here is when this happens is not very close to the star when as we saw that it happens in the sun, this would happen much further away, about five or up to 10 stellar radii. And the reason why that is important is because the density in a corona is a very strong function of radius. So this will be happening in a stellar corona in a region where the density has decayed already by maybe two orders of magnitude or so. So that means that the, this type two radio bursts will be shifted to very long frequencies, which actually we believe they might fall be below what we can actually detect from Earth due to the ionospheric cutoff. So that's basically what I had in mind today. So I will leave you here with my concluding remarks. We believe that magnetic suppression is a viable mechanism for reducing this CME flare association rate, which actually can generate lots of trouble in stellar astrophysics. And in large scale, the large scale field tends to reduce the speed and the energy of the CMEs. This, of course, has consequences for the expected signatures and detection. You can have the situation where you have radio quiet CMEs, or maybe they are just emitting a different radio frequency. 
our numerical simulation of our young sun are, is an idealized case, but still plausible conditions for young sun-like stars. And this mechanism can, can be extended to stronger and highly complex regimes like M-dwarfs, which can have, of course, critical effects for the habitability of these objects. Uh, what would be the influence at the end of this suppression in the mass loss budget, which is one of the most interesting questions here? It will depend on whether large flares or small flares dominate the properties of the corona, and this is a question that can be really and easily answered by X-ray emissions. Um, and the CME confinement of the large scale field will also induce in different coronal activity in the, in the form of different type of flaring, upflows, downflows, and maybe that could be detected by next generation X-ray instrumentation. The bottom line here, maybe not for this audience, but we need to move away from this flare to CME association with stars because it doesn't work. Thanks for your attention. So you said that large flares tend to have CME. Uh, are, don't question, but are there, there other CMEs with no flare? Yeah, there are some. There are some. Um, it will a little bit depend on your definition of a CME, but sometimes we definitely see some evidence of plasmoids and things that are rejected, um, and for which you don't have really a clear association of maybe it was because of this particular event. No, we don't see any um, evidence of flaring. Mm. Uh, but this is a good question because it, it, uh, as these two things should be connected, but they are not instantaneously, they are not simultaneous. There's always going to be some uncertainty of what flare is actually generating which CME. Um, so, but yeah, we do see sometimes things going away without flaring in the sun. This is a good question. Unfortunately, our simulations cannot answer it because our prescription for the eruption, by construction, they is, is basically unstable. They should go away. So we don't simulate the self-consistent, let's say, entanglement of the fields in the surface. We basically impose a condition for an eruption to blow away. Uh, but indeed, you should, have, you should be having all this reconnection happening and reconfiguration of the field, which would induce flare everywhere. It's just that the material is not able to go away it definitely needs to go back to the star and generate signatures everywhere in low temperature lines, high temperature lines, plasma motions, generating prominences, all sorts of coronal activity. Has that been observed? Um, yeah, so there are, there are things that look that way, uh, but again, we have only one detection of our CME so far. Uh, and many candidates with all their pros and cons, let's say, uh, but this particular behavior, you, you could see hints of things like things, for instance, this is a study of A.K. Draconis, where, in which they associate this with uh, some sort of warm color, coronal rain. So it's things that is falling back to the star, but it's too hot. It's not as cold as we observe it in the sun. It's much hotter. So that, that's why they call it the warm coronal rain. Another question? No, thank you again. Thanks to you. Stop. Muy buena. Muy chévere. Genial. Aprendí un montón.